Good afternoon. I think that we're well, welcome to the second uh, research seminar in information systems, ASI. So I'm really glad to be here with Alexandri. Uh, this is going to be the second one. The first one, for those who missed the first one, you can watch on uh, LACAIS2. Uh, we're going to share the link at the end of this presentation. But for those who are uh, into the Moodle platform, you can just you can just search for the, the first topic, and uh, you're going to search. You're going to see the link for the first seminar. Uh, and just search just Google for like ice tube all together without a space in the middle. Uh, you will get straight to the, the like ice tube channel. Right? Like ice for Latin America and Caribbean Association for Information Systems tube. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Thank you, Alexandre, for, for the compliment. And uh, for the second topic, we, we're going to talk about uh, academic writing. Okay. So improving your chances of being published. We have, uh, we're going to have one of the hosts of the seminar, Alexandre Grema from uh, the UTFPR uh, in Campus Curitiba, I think, and uh, here in Brazil. And uh, yeah, I think that we're going to have uh, the planning. The, the planning is to have uh, one hour, more than, I think, one hour and 10 minutes for, for, for presentation or less than that. And uh, after that, we might have uh, a few minutes for discussions. But I just saw the, the slides from Alexandre, and uh, we might have some interactions uh, there's, going going to be a, uh, there's going to be a lot of interaction here. Yes. If this works again, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, the, the, the fact that you used uh, uh, Mentimeter last week made me think that, I, that that's a, a, one of the tools that are good for us to use in a situation like this. Uh, but I have to confess that although I have used Mentimeter many times as someone at your side of the screen, I was never at my side here. So forgive me if uh, it doesn't work exactly as planned, but uh, hopefully it will work. <laughs> Yeah, I think that we are all we are all learning how to use it as well. So I try. We tried to use it last week, and uh, it was really nice to see the engagement. And uh, for this week, I think that's going to be way more because uh, at least I saw a lot of stuff on the slides, and it's going to be very nice as well. So uh, I think that Alexander can start, and uh, yeah, we can just uh, take the floor and uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the idea today, well, the idea of the, the, the series of seminars is that we discuss here topics that relate to, to information systems and information technology used in organizations and by our society. Uh, we're, today, we are thinking about how becoming more efficient and more effective in being published. Uh, and the reason for that is that, uh, I mean, any research is only uh, valued if it's seen by others. Right? So we may, do, we, may, we may have the best research in the world, but if it's not published, others are not going to, to be able to assess it and to decide how good it is and, 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 and why uh, they should, it should be promoted as mainstream research or uh, and, and it just be left aside. So uh, our idea today is, I mean, we, we, we have many uh, graduate students and, and in fact, many master students among us uh, and master students are many times trying to write their first academic paper. Uh, and uh, we hope that after the things that we'll be discussing today, uh, the journey is going to be a little easier, although I have to tell you that it's never easy. Right? Uh, writing, uh, uh, well, writing any, any, in fact, any, any kind of text uh, is a very, I would say, authoritarian um, journey. The, the author wants to make sure that the readers understand precisely and exactly what they wanted to say, and they don't. And usually, authors don't want the the readers to deviate through different poss possible ways. Uh, authors want to dictate the way that their their papers are going to, or, or their work is going to be read and 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 understood by those who, who are, uh, who, who have contact with it, right? Uh, but uh, of course, uh, and we're talking here about an author writing to readers at the other end, but we will see there are other agents in the middle of the way, uh, gatekeepers many times that sort of uh, make it a little more difficult for you to, to assess uh, those uh, readers that you are you're, you're planning if you don't do it the proper way and the proper way in in, in academia is by using the scientific method is by writing uh, papers that uh, are developed using uh, procedures that are considered acceptable by your peers by the other researchers in the field right uh, so before we, we, we get into that just some uh, uh, overview of our agenda. Uh, in the next slide, I will we'll, we'll talk about some housekeeping announcements. It's still about how we're going with these uh, seminars. I think that after we have four or five of them, 
we'll, we'll be able to skip this. But uh, for now, it's important that everyone understands uh, how we're going with with uh, with uh, the series of seminars. So there's going to be some housekeeping announcements. Then we're going to think a little bit uh, uh, about the audience of our academic papers. Uh, and, and notice I'm talking about a paper, but think that whenever I'm talking about a paper, think that it could be any sort of academic reports, a monography, uh, a dissertation, a thesis, uh, and any other sort of uh, academic work. Uh, let's say we'll refer to here as a paper, just to make uh, just for the sake of simplicity. Uh, then we'll think of uh, the stakeholders and the, the agents that are involved in this process of developing uh, your research, but also and mainly publishing your research or making your, your research acceptable to be published. Uh, we'll then get to the structure of an academic paper. And um, you know the reason uh, we'll discuss a structure, a specific structure for an academic paper, it, it is because in academia, differently to what we do if we are writing uh, a novel, for example, we do not want to, to be innovative. We want to follow some rules and write a paper that is basically, and I've already used this term, basically a report of what we of the research we did. Uh, if it's a report, it should not be ambiguous. It should not have any sort of double meaning because we want our reader to understand precisely what we wished. Right? We don't want, uh, as I've already said, we don't want the reader to deviate into different ways uh, uh, during the reading. We don't want the, the reader to start thinking, why hasn't the author gone this other path? You have to anticipate those things and explain in your paper why the procedures that you took are the best possible procedures in a way that the reader is not going to keep challenging your paper. And when I'm talking about the reader here, I'm, I'm talking about other your peers, others, or other scientists or other uh, uh, academic uh, uh, researchers uh, that will have uh, contact with your paper after it has been published. Of course, before that, I said there will be people that will challenge your paper and will try to make sure that when the final reader gets in contact with it, uh, uh, that reader doesn't have to struggle with trying to understand and, and dispute the, the ways you went with your, your paper. So structure is going to be very important because if we follow a standard, if we follow uh, a structure that is usually used, uh, uh, it will be less about the possibility of someone challenging the way you did it, it's going to be much smaller, right? Uh, people already know what to expect, at least in terms of form, format. Uh, then we'll maybe discuss uh, some good practices uh, in writing an academic paper. And notice, uh, I can never say that they are the best practices around. Uh, and, and in fact, they're only, I can only consider them good practices because they seem to have been working for quite a few people. Right? Uh, and, and, and we'll have uh, some uh, time for some final thoughts and, and for your questions. Uh, in fact, as Flavio told, uh, we want to make this very interactive, so I've, I've, I, I will ask you a few questions in the middle of the way that will probably even divert the way I go. So I'm in this case here, this is not an academic report. Uh, I don't mind if I divert from where I originally planned. Of course, my questions will be sort of directed so that you, I hope that you go in the direction that I planned you to go. But if you go in a different direction, I'll be quite happy to, 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 to take this, this wild path with you and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll also uh, gain some knowledge out of it. Um, so the, the, the housekeeping announcements that I had for you is, uh, well, as usual, English is our communication language. Uh, you can either open your microphone at any time if you want to ask, even in the middle of our, our presentation, at least in the, in the middle of my presentation today. Uh, you can, uh, well, writing something uh, in the chat is a little trickier. Maybe Flav, you can, can help me checking uh, if there are questions there afterwards. But I, at this right moment, I'm not being able to see uh, if uh, people write anything on uh, in the in the chat, right? But but uh, it's it's a possibility also. Uh, our meetings are going to be uh, always on Google Meet, and the address for that is the one that you use today. Uh, hopefully, we will not have to change it. Uh, but if we ever have to change it, the 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 right uh, URL is going to be uh, indicated there uh, in Moodle, and will also be provided in uh, uh, Google Calendar, right? For those of you who who have this already organized in, the, in Google Calendar. If you, if there's anyone who's here for the first time, and if you wish me uh, to send you a Google Calendar um, a warning of the the, 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 the next uh, seminars that we'll have, feel free to send me an email, G-R-A-E-M-L, Gremel, my surname, at utfpr.edu.br. Uh, 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 and, and I will, I'll be happy to include you there, right? Um, I have, we had already told you, feel free to invite any friends or colleagues to take part on this. We, we, we don't be, in fact, we want to, this will be as open as possible and involve 
as many people as we can from different um, universities. Uh, I mean, we, we plan this if mainly for Latin America because, of course, we are we are all sort of in the same situation. We're 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 all sort of struggling with a, with with a second language here and trying to uh, write in a in a in a second language that is not our own. And and we, we sort of have the same problem. So this is why we plan to have uh, uh, this uh, focus on Latin American uh, researchers and students. But at the same time, uh, we know that there will be people uh, participating uh, in, at least in, in a few sessions uh, from universities on, in other parts of the world as well, and everyone is welcome. Uh, well, the enrolled students, those of you who, 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 who will get credits uh, from a course that you're taking either, either at uh, Universidade Federal do ABC or Universidade Tecnológica Federal do Paraná, you have to always remember that you have to prepare before the sessions, you have to read the papers, and you have to watch videos that are uh, that have been separated for you in, and, and are available there in, in, in a link in our YouTube, in, sorry, in our uh, Moodle. Uh, and you have to write a, a little summary of uh, that preparation of yours before we, we meet every, every Wednesday. And then after the meeting, there's also an, an, an assessment that is writing something about what happened in the meeting. So for example, I mean, yeah, you should have already written something uh, about the videos that you watched and the, the paper that you read uh, before uh, uh, this meeting now, and you, you will also have to write some 200 words. It's not much, but it's so that we keep connected all the time, some 200 words after uh, our meeting today about the things that maybe we discuss here and that didn't show uh, before in those papers and videos, right? Uh, whoever is here, uh, whoever is not, uh, um, well, in, in fact, for, for whoever is, is watching this now, if you want to have a certificate of this seminar, you just have to go into bit.do, Lacai's attendance, the way it's written here, and, uh, and and just write your your email and your name and email, and we will send you uh, a certificate of participation in each one of the the, the, the seminars that you take part. Uh, of course, this has to be you have to write uh, 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 well, you have you have to fill in this form during the, the conference right now, right? Or right after, uh, it cannot be in a week from now, right? In a week from now, you may get a certificate for next week's um, um, seminar, but it, it's good. I, I know that many, many people uh, need sometimes proof that they were doing this for work or even for schooling. Uh, so just fill in the, the form uh, and uh, we will uh, send you instructions on how to, to get your certificate somewhere uh, during the week. Uh, that was what we had for housekeeping. Uh, we had, uh, Flavio had already mentioned uh, Lakai's Tube. This is it, right? Lakai's Tube is a YouTube channel. Uh, you will see that our seminar for last week is already there in our Lakai's Tube, along with uh, some other interesting, uh, uh, I mean, some, some of the presentations we had in the ISLA conference earlier in August and, and, and some other material, but all of our seminars will be placed here. If you just write Lakai's Tube on Google or at least on YouTube, uh, it will get you there. Right? Um, still uh, about the housekeeping. So today we, we have our second seminars. All of the others are already uh, listed here. Uh, there is only one seminar that is not listed yet, and but we'll have it listed until next uh, week. Uh, but this is so that you, you you can already plan what you want to, to see. Uh, our interaction uh, will always happen through uh, Moodle. Uh, it's very easy. Bit.do uh, slash uh, R, but well, the, the crazy thing here is that the R the, and the SIS are in capital letters and the E is in small letter. Uh, and when you get to Moodle, uh, if, if you're doing that for the first time, uh, you will have to fill in a form as well. And at the end, uh, it will ask you for an access code to, to, to gain access to the, to, to the course. And that access code is one, two, three, four, five, six, right? We also have a WhatsApp group. Uh, 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 you, you, if you, uh, the, the link for the WhatsApp, WhatsApp group is there in, in Moodle and, and someone uh, hopefully can also, maybe Flavio can copy this and paste in our chat so that if you want to receive uh, information through WhatsApp, it's available to you. I guess that's all for, no, it's not all, right? It's, it's, well, this, this is about the assessment of uh, students. You already know what you have to do. 200 words summary before, in preparation for the, for, for the, the, the seminar, 200 word uh, reflection after the, the, the seminar. That's only for uh, UF ABC and UTFPR students. Uh, and now we get to finally to the beginning of our talk today. Uh, we'll start talking about the audience uh, of an academic uh, paper. Uh, and in order for me to have an idea of 
who do you think the audience of an academic paper is? I have prepared here a questionnaire on uh, Mentimeter. So you just go, uh, go into uh, menti.com with this code here. And uh, just tell me who, do you, who you think that the audience for an academic paper is. I think I left three possibilities there. Just feel free to write one, two, three, uh, uh, you know, subjects uh, or, or objects, let's say, if, if we write and if we, if we are, as the authors, want to be authoritarian and, and, and impose, let's say, our idea to our readers, who are the targets of our academic uh, um, papers? Uh, I'm uh, curious to know. Uh, and it's already starting to show up there. I'll give you about 30 seconds, so I have some time to drink some water here. Alexandre, there is a, a question from Lucas. Uh, sure. Uh, where is that? Uh, where is that? Where is that? Uh, here. Uh, he's asking if it isn't good for us as scientists to always try to challenge what are being presented and embrace being challenged. Uh, he's probably saying that because I, I, I told that the, the author wants to be the, the author wants to be the author, right? The author doesn't want to give room for flexibility in, in understanding his ideas. But he's right in the sense that the, the reader should challenge uh, whatever he reads, he or she reads, uh, and, and with the intent to, to know if that's good science or not, right? We, I don't want to anticipate my next question about the, those, those gatekeepers, right, in the middle of the way. We already have people that, are, that have that task of making sure that, or, or trying to make sure that whatever is published is correct, uh, makes sense. Uh, but we know that, and, and besides, uh, we know that science is something, science differently to religion is a truth that is good for now, right? We, we don't have uh, uh, an answer that is a definite answer. Uh, the answers that science provides are answers that satisfy us for the moment. It's, it's the best answer that we can have for now. This is why we, we have uh, uh, many issues that uh, are discussed in, in, in research and are discussed in, in science, in academia, and they, they evolve in a way that we change our uh, uh, idea about uh, something. And it's basically because we don't have dogmas, right? We don't, we're, we're not stick with an idea just because we have to believe on it. So we should challenge uh, ideas uh, and, 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 and sorry, who was that? Who asked that? Uh, like sorry? Who, was, who, who asked that? Uh, Lucas. Lucas. Okay, so I, I think Lucas is, is right uh, in the sense that we should be very critical uh, as researchers, I'm not sure that if, if we, although we call ourselves scientists sometimes, but uh, uh, in, in, let's say, in the fields that we are dealing with here, computer science uh, and, and business and uh, eventually sociology, uh, those are fields that at least uh, uh, someone in physics uh, or, uh, or would, not, would probably not consider as scientists. But anyway, let's say academians, right? Um, well, um, so so we 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 have we already have a nice uh, word cloud there that shows researchers as being the the main um, the focus of our uh, attention when we are writing an academic paper. So other researchers, our peers, uh, and that's definitely the case. And I guess uh, when you when when someone uh, you say researchers or scientists or the community, it's it's the research community uh, that's the case. I think that if we are scientists or uh, or academians that are doing research in a university. We always have to think of teach of, of students, many students, but also other our colleagues, other professors, uh, as uh, also a focus of our work. Right? Although those that are more purists would say, you "No, know, researchers talk to researchers." And I, I think we have to be a little more, um, let's say, flexible than that. Uh, mainly, if we, if, if, I mean, I mean, if we have to keep a dialogue with society. Society doesn't uh, want to have researchers that only talk to other researchers. That that seems to be like people that you know that are snobby and uh, no, they, they want us to solve problems of the society and they want us to engage in a discussion with society as well. Right? This is actually something that has changed in in science well, over time. We had to become more pragmatic. We had and we had to notice that we we have to to not only answer our research questions so that other researchers are. Um, interested in our work, but you, we also have to make this work relevant to other people because it's usually other people that are responsible for funding our work, for example. This, this is a problem that we have right now in, in Brazil. Uh, researchers are being challenged, and in, in fact, the, the, the university is being challenged, challenged 
as a place where there is a lot of money spent and sometimes little results to society. Of course, whoever is here uh, probably doesn't agree with that. Uh, but the reason why there are people that think that way is because sometimes we're not good at communicating uh, the results of our work also to other stakeholders than just our peers, just uh, other researchers or, or even our students and, and, and our colleagues. Right? I think we do, nowadays, we, we, we very pragmatically, we do have to do that. So we should think that uh, uh, academic work should generate uh, good research material that will be discussed at a, at a very high level with our peer researchers, but it would also be uh, good if we thought that we have to communicate with students and society in general, the community, right? The community here, I'm not sure, of course, whoever wrote community could be thinking of the community as, a, as the research community, but I hope that they're also thinking the community that supports uh, researchers somehow, right? Uh, and so uh, we may have different uh, um, publics, we, we, we may have different targets, and uh, of course, depending on who the target is, we'll have also to choose different outlets. Uh, academic journals, those very those academic journals that are focused on papers that are written to other researchers, uh, they are not as interested in responding to society directly. But uh, nowadays, we see many academic journals that are not so how, how is it, so, so uh, that, that are not focused in the discussion of, of the academic work among uh, peers only that already wish to communicate the results of our our work to other people. In fact, there are many different ways that we can do that these days. I mean, it doesn't even have to be an academic paper. Remember that I said an academic, I would deal here with the term academic paper as being a monography, a dissertation, a thesis, or whatever. It could even be a YouTube video, right? Maybe I'm forcing things here a bit, but uh, I think that we do have the duty of communicating the results of the science that we generate to uh, more people than just our peers. Of course, first it has to be, uh, uh, accepted by our peers so we we, we, we wish that the, in science that has been uh found other people that are interested in it and, and that believe that it's good science but as soon as we have that we should already start thinking how do we spread this idea to others but this this first idea here was just to say that we may have different academic uh, the, the focus of, of the paper or, or the focus of our writing may be different if we are writing a paper in a very traditionally academic uh, journal they are going to be very interested in our methodology because the methodology that we use, which means how we performed our research, is a very important sign that the, 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 the research is was done in a proper manner. Uh, many researchers are tend to be even more interested in the form or the, or the, the how so, or the, the, the procedures, the methodolo methodological procedures, than the results, or at least they only get interested in the results after they have already checked the methodology and found out that the methodology is good, right? So uh, this actually, uh, you, you've probably all heard about this huge dilemma that any researcher has of, um, uh, you know, having to deal with rigor and relevance. We want to have a rigorous paper in the sense that we, we want to be methodolo methodologically correct, but at the same time, we want it to be relevant. We, th there is no relevance if there, if there isn't rigor, right? But at the same time, if we only focus in discussing the rigor, discussing the, the preciseness of the methodology that we're using, our paper is going to be so boring that only our colleague, colleagues, uh, other researchers are going to, to, to be able to read. So what is, you know, who is our audience? If we're writing to the general public, we'll probably write a paper that is not so concerned with the methodology any longer because the, the community, the, the, the society in general is more interested in the results of science than in the, the means or the, the, the ways that we used to get to, to that result. For example, we are all, uh, considering that there is no one here that is in biology, biochemistry, or whatever in, in one of these fields, we are all just uh, uh, people in the society with respect to a vaccine to COVID-19, right? Uh, are we interested on how the vaccine is being developed? Or are we interested that we do have a vaccine by the end of the year, for example, right? We as society, we wish this to, have, to have this this vaccine as soon as possible. The researchers, they are very concerned with the methodology because, of course, depending on the methodology that they use, they may never get to a vaccine that that is effective. Right. So they, when, when they're dealing with their colleagues, they are very focused on discussing the method so that they trust the results. Society says, keep us from the details. Right. If you already agreed that the vaccine works, 
we will be happy to take it, even if we have to take it in our forehead, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and that will probably make you understand why if you're writing a paper, for example, to the MIS quarterly, or those of, of you who, well, MIS quarterly is probably the, the highest impact factor journal in the area of information systems in the world right now, right? Very academic, uh, I would say rigor is definitely a must, and sometimes papers are boring because, you know, it's so much methodology that uh, other people that are not so interested in, the, in that specific topic will not be able to handle it. Uh, uh, but but it's definitely very 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 good and very, very respectful uh, um, uh, journal and, and a journal which publishes some of the best papers in our area. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have Harvard Business Review. Harvard Business Review is it, it is an academic journal to some extent, but it, 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 its purpose is not writing to other academians. Uh, yeah, the purpose there is to write to the society in general. Right? So you'll see that a paper written in, in Harvard Business Review or Slow Management Review, uh, the, the journal, one of the journals uh, that MIT has to convey uh, some of its uh, technolo te technology related uh, research to the world in general, they're not focused in the methodology. So this is a, a, a first thing that we have to know. What is our audience? Right? Of course, if we're doing science in a very strict way, it will be, and you're right, it, it, it is the researchers. Right? And uh, I remember that last year I had a, a, a long discussion with a class of students of mine because they said, researchers talk to researchers. And then uh, I had some students that were giving me the speech that I'm, not, that I'm now giving you, right? And they said, no, you have to talk to society as well. And uh, uh, so at that time, I didn't have to play both role, roles. And I was saying, no, I talk to other researchers, and then someone will come and translate my research into something that society that is more palatable to society. So there will be, in, we may have people here that are researchers, and I think all of us are to some extent because you're all, they're all writing theses, um, uh, dissertations, monographies, uh, papers, right? Uh, we're all trying to do research that, that, that is strong in methodology, but at the same time, I think that, uh, and, and that we have to do each time more that think of also communicating to the general public. Uh, so there is no problem for an academic to write for Harvard Business Review or for Slow Management Review, or even here in Brazil uh, for some uh, academic journals that are focusing on, um, on talking directly to the society. It's important that we know who the audience, the audience is, because if we write a very academic paper to a journal that wants to establish a communication channel with society, that paper is not going to be published. In the same way, if we write a paper that in which we're trying to talk to, to society in general and not to other academians and send it to a, a very academically oriented uh, journal, it, it's also not going to be published, right? So this is, this is a, a, an import, important uh, uh, issue here. Hey, Shadri, uh, sure. we've, we have a very long discussion here on chat, so I think I will just summarize a little bit. Please do. Uh, yeah, so I think the first, uh, the first comment is from Pablo uh, and Mateus. So, they basically ask about, I mentioned the, the, the hard structure of papers and uh, that this hard, like let's say hard structure of papers makes difficult uh, to communicate the results to the overall community. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the same for computer science. And Pablo again mentioned that's a very, very, uh, very uh, important barrier for reaching the society with the, 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 the academic results, for example. Yeah, it's, it's very important the same paper that will go to the two different audiences. Right? It has to be two different things. This is why I say, who are we writing to is the first thing that we have to decide. Right? But we have a second uh, decision here that is also, uh, well, a second issue that we have to discuss here, a second question that I, that I have to pose here, uh, and that I would also like to hear from you, is who are the agents that are involved in academic publishing? Because it's definitely not just the author and the Reader, right? There are other people in the middle of the way. There are other people that are interested in academic uh, materials, and there are other people that therefore affect how uh, the, or the whole academic process or the academic publication process will take place. Uh, I don't know if you can already uh, participate on that. It's the same code. It's just the next question that comes there on, on Mentimeter. Yeah, so I think that you can use the time while you're, we are waiting for the answers. And, yeah, uh, I just, just, as, as I haven't seen no answers yet here, I'm a little concerned. Is, is this working? Did we get the question at least? Oh yeah, it, it, it worked. Someone is already, okay. Uh, but so the, the question is about um, venues. So some people are some people are asking about 
uh, some uh, uh, some venue, like some journals sim uh, similar to uh, HBR, the Harvard Business School in Brazil and also in Latin America. And another people is asking about indicator, and Lucas is asking about indicators, for example, if business journals count uh, towards the author's uh, 80 index, which is like uh, the Google uh, citation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Guilherme is asking about uh, some journal, if you know some journal or other journals uh, for scientific uh, dissemination or publications, for example. Well, uh, I, I, my idea here, and, I, and of course, we're all tempted to say, oh, write to this journal, to that journal, right? Uh, but I think that each one of us will have, to, there's a very easy way of choosing where you should submit your research to, at least that I have been using with my co-authors uh, lately. But what we do is we start writing a paper about the topic that interests us. And when we're writing a paper, we, we always have to search for references, right? We, 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 need, uh, we will have to cite other work that has been uh, done prior to ours. Uh, in fact, uh, this is part of the, the structure. We have to have a review, or at least we have to uh, um, think of, uh, of uh, references uh, to, to the work that we are we're developing. And then what we usually do is, uh, as soon as our, our work starts getting shape, we already have a few, let's say a few journals that we had three or four papers from those journals that were cited in our paper. Then we think, well, this, this journal is probably a journal that is interested in, in the topic that we are dealing with. Right? But we, again, our strategy is we don't wait and we don't finish a paper and then we go check uh, and, 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 and then we try and send the paper to, to a journal. Uh, th this is a, a, an important thing. We have to know the journals we're sending our papers to. So it's, it's important that you have already read papers that are written there. In fact, in that, in, in that sense, it's also good that if we have already cited three or four papers from a journal, that means that we already know the, the structure, that they, the, the way they like the papers. And we probably like it too, because uh, we, we, if we chose to cite those papers, it's because we thought that they were relevant. So we, we liked their structure, we liked their, you know, their, their content, and so on and so forth. So instead of recommending you write to this journal or to that journal, I would say write to journals uh, that you that you cite. If you're citing uh, a, a journal with uh, some uh, some frequency, that means that that journal deals with the topic the, the topic that interests you. Right? I'm not trying to escape your question here. It's just that I, I think that each one of us, depending on the topic that we're working, will have um, better outlets for their, their their work. Going back to the the here to the, the the agents that you have already included, I see there editors, reviewers. Uh, very big here. Uh, well, uh, for some reason, I don't see that the, the reader is small over here, but it's probably because uh, you probably thought, who else, in addition to the authors and, 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 the, and the readers, right? I see authors and readers small here. They should be big, but it's probably because you think they're at one end and the other, and there, there are people in the middle, right? Uh, so reviewers and editors are definitely people that are important here. Uh, well, journals are not people, but, and, and they're usually represented by, by the, the editors and, and reviewers and so on. Uh, but I, I would like to focus a little more in the in the editors and reviewers uh, and, and the readers because I think that those people each each group of readers have some intentions with your paper. Editors have different intentions. Reviewers have different intentions. Let's see what readers. Uh, uh, I'm sure that we could write other things about what the readers uh, do and think. But basically, the readers read uh, the abstract first to decide if they want to read the full paper. I don't know if you do that, but uh, I'd say that in a world where we, we have very little time and a lot to read, uh, that's a very good thing to do, right? You read the abstract and then you decide, is this a paper that uh, I should read because it's important for my own research or for my own knowledge or my own understanding of a problem, or is this a paper that I should skip, right? This is in fact, knowing that the, the, the reader starts reading the abstract and only if the abstract interests them is that they are, they are going uh, further, I have to say that uh, the abstract is a very important part of a of a of, of, of any piece of work, right? You you definitely have to, and, and, and the abstract is different here to a, a movie trailer, right? A movie trailer uh, tells a little bit of the story and then stops, uh, so that people have to go to the movies and watch the film, right? Uh, an abstract has to give the full idea of the paper. It has to provide a very good understanding of what the objective was. It has to provide a very good understanding of the methodology that was used especially if we're talking here about uh, an academic paper that is uh, intended to, uh, to, to appear to other researchers because they will not pay attention to your results if your methodology is loose, if they don't, believe, if they don't trust your methodology. And then you have to communicate your results. And based on those three things appearing in the abstract, 
the reader will decide if uh, the, the, the paper deserves full attention or if it's a paper that will never be read. So never, you know, many times people write the abstracts very quickly because they think, well, it doesn't matter that the, the, the real information is in the paper, but the abstract has to be a, it, it, it's all in itself. It has to contain the whole, the whole has to be there. It's, it's almost like if it were an hologram of your paper, right? It has to be, if someone reads the, 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 the abstract, uh, that person should already feel um, uh, satisfied with the fact that they understood what the paper is about, what the methodology was, and what the main results were. And then they will only get to the paper if they're really interested in the, to in the topic and needs to know all, all the details. Uh, the readers may browse through the paper to have a first impression. Uh, and this is, again, a reason why we want some structure in an academic paper. Because, for example, uh, where do you think that people will find the objective of, of a paper? Uh, well, of course, in the abstract, for sure. But in the, in the paper, where would it appear? In which session? Would anyone open their mic there and tell me what they think? In the introduction. In the introduction. Usually, I would say in the last paragraph of the introduction, or if you have one of those uh, papers that are structured in a little more bureaucratic way that have that the last paragraph of the introduction is just uh, telling you what the structure of the rest of the, uh, the paper is, it's going to be a little before that. So the introduction will have, let's say, the context. Uh, it, it will sort of uh, try to, to help you get into the mood to read the, 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 the full paper. And then at the final lines of the, the introduction, you have the objective or, I don't know, the, some, sometimes people prefer not to write an objective. They prefer to have a research question. It doesn't matter, but uh, the, 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 the reader deserves to know very clearly and very soon in the paper, I would say in the introduction, what the paper is about. Right? Uh, so what, what, what I'm saying is that people expect already to find the objective at, sort of at the end of the introduction. People expect to find a second uh, part of the paper to be, and I'm already anticipating one of the questions that I would uh, ask you afterwards, uh, but they, they want to have some, uh, some literature review or some, uh, sometimes, uh, depending on the area, you will call it, uh, uh, what is it, um, well, the, the state of the art or whatever, uh, in, a, in a second part of the paper, then the methodology, uh, and then the, the, the discussion of, of, of the findings, and then uh, the conclusions. Uh, um, notice I, I'm, I'm talking here about a specific kind of paper uh, that is what we call a theoretical empirical paper. And in fact, I, I believe that uh, we should only talk about that kind of uh, paper for now, regardless of if we are in computer science or in business or in the area that we are, regardless of where we are, we should always think uh, of an academic paper as having a theoretical part, which is when you go there and see what others did before you, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you actually want to do what uh, Newton proposed when, he's, when he claimed that he had, or I, I will not recall his words, but by climbing on the shoulders of giants, he could see further, right? Uh, that idea that Newton expressed uh, more beautifully than I did now uh, was basically saying, well, uh, I didn't start my research from, from scratch. I started from where others had stopped. So first I have to review what, what others have done. And then uh, by doing that, I will get to a, an interesting uh, um, project or an interesting research project. And then I can go a step further. Right? Uh, so uh, uh, when I say that we, most of us will write uh, uh, theoretical empirical papers, it is because even an undergraduate student doing their first, uh, here in Brazil we call Iniciação Científica, right? Uh, their first initi initi initiation into, into research is already able to write a very interesting paper that will be read by specialists if he or she has some very interesting empirical data, right? Uh, even the, let's say, the, the, the most famous researcher in the field in a specific uh, area uh, will be interested in reading a paper that has, that, that discusses uh, new uh, pragmatic, new, new data, uh, uh, considering the, the theory that is already available and, and showing where the new data uh, corroborates or, 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 let's say, reinforces the ideas that were already present in the literature and where the new uh, data sort of uh, makes you think, well, maybe that's not the whole truth. Maybe we have to change something here. Maybe there's, maybe we have to research further because my data is proving that, um, you know, whatever uh, theory we had before is not working uh, so suitably any longer. 
for that. It's not that proper thing of saying that you only have to find one black swan in a lake to, uh, let's say, to take out of the brick uh, of the wall of science a brick that said that all swans were white. Right? Uh, so sometimes data is uh, what will bring the relevance to a uh, to a, a theoretical empirical paper. And uh, what I'm saying here is that, of course, we could write, for example, an essay. Right? Some of you probably, some of the professors here will probably have already written essays that were published as academic work. Right? Essays are not based on, on, on uh, data that is collected using a, a rigorous methodological procedure. Essays are written based on someone's experience. So my question is, is it possible for someone to write an essay to a, to, a, to a journal that uh, accepts papers that are sent to it, uh, not invited papers, uh, it, it wouldn't be possible for someone to send a, an essay and have it published, you know, going through a double blind review process? Probably not, because an essay is good for whoever, for, for the person who writes it. So, for example, when you have the main researcher in a specific field writing an essay about a topic, all other researchers will be willing to read it because they know that that person is someone who's very experienced and they're interested in, in a person's experience. But we don't want the undergraduate students to write an essay because he, he, he or she still doesn't have that experience that will make the essay a valid, valid asset to the community. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, uh, uh, I don't want you to get me wrong here. Uh, for example, I have only being invited to write uh, an essay once in my life, actually, actually about a couple of months ago, uh, and then I, I didn't have the time to write it uh, so far uh, until now, and, and maybe when, when I have the time, uh, the journal will not want it any longer, I don't know. But they, they asked me because they knew that for, for that specific topic, I was someone that others would want to, to listen to. Right? Uh, but then it's an invited paper. Right? Uh, all other situations in my, my life as a, as, as a researcher, it was sending papers to double blind review processes uh, in which uh, people will value your work for its face value. It's, uh, uh, it doesn't matter who wrote, uh, uh, what, what will be uh, assessed is the quality of what is on paper without knowing, without having to know who wrote it. Right? Uh, so, uh, and, and, and in all these situations, we have to think of, uh, of the way that the reader goes, right? Uh, the reader only trusts the results when uh, he, he, uh, when, when he or she understands and agrees with the method methodology. We're talking here about academic researchers, academic, uh, uh, you know, scientists. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, readers are conscious of format because if things are at the place where they expect to be, it makes it easier for them to browse, for example, through the paper or even to just go directly to one part of the paper or another, depending on what they're looking for right now. And, but of course, they are conscious of the format, but they are interested in the content. Let's say uh, the editor. Uh, the editor uh, the editor is a, a gatekeeper. The editor is there to make sure that we, we don't all enjoy the party, unfortunately. Uh, the editor is there to make sure that whatever gets into, published in his or her journal is uh, to the standards that uh, are believed to be the, the, the right ones for that, for that journal, right? Uh, so uh, the, the editor assesses the pot potential papers that will interest the readers. Uh, uh, so first, and, and there, for example, the title is very important at, at the first moment because the title already catches the attention of the, the editor and may already make the editor have a good mood or a bad mood to your paper, depending on you know the way you wrote that title. Right? Of course, having a beautiful title and then having a, a poor paper will not help, but it's good to have a paper with a good title to call this first uh, to call attention and to and, and to make uh, the editor already willing to read and thinking that others are going to, to, to also have the intention of reading. They, uh, of course, the editor wants people to read uh, his journal because uh, he's also interested in, in what we call the, in, in the impact factor of, of his journal. He wants the journal to be published, uh, sorry, to be cited. Uh, journal is considered a better journal if more people cite the papers that are, are included there. Right? Uh, so for, for that, uh, the, the, the editor needs novelty, but uh, also relevance. It's not just because it's new, it has to be new and, and relevant. Um, the editor decides if a paper would be relevant to, to, the, to the readership, to the, to the readers, uh, and the editor is, uh, he cannot, he or she cannot give up rigor, right? Because if the methodology is not correct, uh, uh, the, 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 the paper is not going to have uh, much credit with the readers and it's not going to be cited. Right? 
So, um, uh, and, and then finally, the, the editor invites reviewers to help decide on the rigor of submissions, not only the rigor, but the rigor and the relevance of uh, submissions. Uh, usually two or three reviewers that will review papers. Reviewers are a funny bunch of people. And uh, probably many of you have already reviewed papers. In fact, I would say it's a great thing to do. Every one of us becomes a better writer the more we review other people's papers. Right? So whenever you have a chance, do it. Uh, you, if you have a colleague who's writing a paper, ask to review for them informally, right? Uh, because reviewing other people's work will, and of course you have to tell them what was right and what was wrong, what was good and what was bad. When you, when you have to reflect about that on other people's work, you will also improve your understanding of what you have to do about your own work. Right? So I have this impression that I became a better writer when I started reviewing other people's work and I, and I had to write uh, text in which I was explaining why uh, a paper had problems or what, what, what were the, the, the advantages of it. Uh, and, and by doing that, I, I, thought, well, I thought, well, that's something that I can do in my papers as well. Right? Uh, but reviewers are, are weird because many times you get papers to review and we don't have much time. We're doing that along with all the other activities that uh, we are involved with. Right? So reviewers many times wish to get rid of papers as soon as they can. So they, they, actually they're very happy to refuse a paper if they find that the paper has flaws, has problems. Uh, so one of the tricks to have a paper published is making sure that reviewers are not going to find any problems with it. Right? Um, well, that, that, that's probably easier said than done, uh, but I will show you in the next slides uh, the kind of questions that a reviewer is asked to write about each paper they review. And you will see that, uh, I mean, the answers that they can give there, we already show if they will like, if they liked or not uh, the paper. Not only receive more papers than they wish to review, uh, cannot give up rigor, only trust the results of a paper when they understand and agree with the methodology. So never, never think that the methodology is something that you, you could, you know, do the way you wish and, and, and nobody will care about it. In fact, the methodology is very important because if it's not well understood, uh, and if it's not explained in a in, in a way, the read and the reviewer uh, is confident to say, yeah, th this is a uh, this paper is right. Uh, it's going to be refused. Uh, the reviewers may be willing to reject a paper due to format reasons because it's easy. Remember, we receive many more papers to review than we would wish. We many times we don't have time, and, and and a journal asks us for a review. Uh, well, maybe the right thing to, to, to say would be say, no, sorry, I can't right now, but sometimes you say, okay, I'll do it. And then you're very happy when you find that the paper doesn't have, for example, a clear objective stated in the, in the introduction. And then you already say, well, I, I don't, I, you know, it's very easy to, to, to get one of those forms in, in the evaluation and say the, the objective is not clear. So for the reader, the, uh, sorry, for, 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 for the writer, uh, for the author, an important thing to do is write your objective very clearly in the introduction, have it very clearly posed also in the, in the abstract, but make sure that it's in the abstract and in the, the introduction. Right? Remember, the abstract is a completely separate thing. People will read the abstract and that's a sole thing. And when they read the paper, they want to find all those elements uh, in, in the paper again. So you can't have it just on the, uh, the abstract. It has to be in the paper as well. Uh, and sometimes have a set of predefined questions to answer prior to giving their opinion this is, for example, a set of uh, questions that I had to use this morning when I was reviewing a paper, uh, paper for IT and People. IT and People is a, one of our good journals in the field of information systems. And look what they asked the, 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 the um, reviewer to write about when they are reviewing a paper. First, the originality of the paper. Does the paper contain new and significant information adequate to justify publication? If the paper is talking about a topic that a lot has already been said, and it doesn't bring any news. I'm sorry, it's not going to, to interest other people. It's not going to be cited because there is other more relevant papers that have already been written before. Right? Uh, relationship to literature. Uh, does the paper demonstrate an adequate understanding of the relevant li literature in the field and cite an appropriate range of literature sources? Uh, is any significant work ignored? Right? Notice, if you don't do it right, that second part of the, the, the paper, the, the literature review, right? Uh, the, the, the reviewer has another chance here of saying, sorry, there was no good uh, literature review. This guy did not climb the shoulders of giants, so he or she cannot see very further because, uh, you know, there, there was work that needed to be done before going into the more pragmatic uh, uh, field experiment. The methodology now. Uh, is the paper's argument built on an appropriate base of theory, concepts, or, or other ideas? Has the research 
or equivalent intellectual work on, uh, on uh, which the paper is based being well designed, are the method employed appropriate? If the reviewer does not agree with your method or is not convinced that you use the method with rigor, uh, the answer to this question is going to be no, and you already have a, uh, your, your chance of being rejected uh, have increased a lot. Results. Are results presented clearly and analyzed appropriately? Are the conclusions adequately tied together to the other elements of the paper? What important, when you're, what important thing to do when you're, you're, you're dealing with results, and many, many times writers forget their literature review when they're, they're analyzing their data. One important thing is to go back to the literature review and show uh, precisely where your data agree with what the literature already said and where it, it shows that a different way, uh, that a different track has to be taken. Right? Uh, so it's very important that this uh, fourth part of the paper here, notice uh, uh, this, is, this will probably be session two. Session one will be the, the, the introduction where even the originality would be uh, explained, uh, justification of the paper. Session two, would be the, the session on, on literature review method, methodology, session four, results. This session has to be very well connected to session two. If there is any literature that is reviewed in, 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 ch in chapter or session two and is not uh, called upon uh, on uh, the sessions on results later, you may say, why is that there in, the, in, in session two anyway? Right? Uh, Another topic still, uh, pra practicality and, uh, uh, and or research implications. Does the paper identify clearly any, impl uh, any implications for practice and or for the research? Are these implications consistent with the findings and conclusions of the paper? Uh, the thing that I, I told you, it's important that we do research for other researchers, but we should be connected to the needs of society. Right? We want to, to have results that can solve problems that people have or that they think that they will have in the future. And finally, uh, six, quality of communication. Does the paper clearly express uh, its case uh, measured against the technical language uh, of the fields and the expected knowledge of the journals? Uh, and I can't read the rest here because there is some, something in front of it. Uh, uh, it's important that the, 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 the text is smooth in the way that it goes. And, and this is actually a problem that we have when we're writing in a, in a second language. Right? Uh, many times we get rejected because it's easy for a reviewer to say, well, you know, uh, the author should pay more attention to language. Come on, it, it has to be one of those Slack reviewers that uh, uh, wants to get rid of the paper very quickly, because if the ideas are really great, it, it's easy for you to say, like, yeah, accept the paper after a language review. Right? But in fact, if the language is difficult, uh, if it's, it's a paper that um, the, the, the reviewer uh, struggles to, to, to go through, uh, it's going to be difficult for, for the, the, the reviewer to say something nice about it. Well, uh, this is a, the, an example from this, uh, from IT and people. Uh, I could say that uh, other journals and conferences and events have different templates. Um, some of them are, are, are even uh, nastier in the sense that they, they will ask the reviewer to grade a paper with respect to several different items. Uh, and then after a paper has been rated as poor for methodology, poor for language, poor for whatever other aspects, it's very difficult for the reviewer at the end to say, yes, accept the paper and accept it as is. Right? Uh, it, it's not going to happen. So it's important for us to sort of start to know uh, what happens at the background, the ways that our papers are reviewed, uh, so that we can already think of these things beforehand. Uh, and uh, we can already make sure that the reviewer is not going to be able to say that our paper is bad in any of this, uh, with respect to any of these uh, issues here. Well, an academic paper will have some sort of structure. What should be the, 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 the parts of an academic paper? What should be the, the titles of the chapters or the sessions of an academic paper? Well, it, they don't necessarily have to be the titles themselves, right? But what should we have in any part of, the, of an academic paper? I've given you a few possibilities there. I think I've asked even for six or seven. I don't remember when, when, uh, how many I put there, but just, Give us your thoughts and let's see uh, if they match some of the things that we've already uh, been discussing here. Alexandre, we might have uh, one really good uh, question from Gabriel Budinho. Can you can you open your mic and uh, make the question yourself and explain it a little bit? Gabriel is not as far away as uh, our other colleague from Canada, but he's also far away. 
No, 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 so Canada, only from Uruguay. But the question is, if you are talking about each role in the same order or in the same way that they participate in the evaluation process. First one appears the readers, then the editor make the selection, and later appears the reviewers. That is the uh, more common uh, order. Uh, that's good, Gabriel. What, what, what I mean is, uh, when I uh, well, let's say that the, the editor and the reviewers are what we call gatekeepers. If you do not please them, your text is never get to be seen by the by the readers. Right? It, it's not going to be published. So basically, what a, a, an editor does, an editor receives your draft, receives your paper, and has a look at it. Uh, depending on, on how busy the editor is, and depending on, on how let's say picky uh, he or she is. Uh, the editor is going to read the whole paper. Usually what the editor is going to do is, uh, the editor is going to browse through the paper and see if the structure is there and see if uh, the methodology seems adequate, but he's not going to, to, to you know, get into the details. Then it will, if, if, uh, if the paper uh, survives, let's say this desk evaluation by the, the editor, it will be sent to, to two or three reviewers to write a, more detailed report, right? And uh, it's very difficult for a paper to be accepted as is uh, in a journal. Uh, usually, after those reports are presented to the editor, the editor will make a decision. Uh, the decision may be that the paper is going to be published, but it still requires um, some work, minor minor adjustments, or uh, he or she, she may even say, well, this paper has potential, but we, we need some major changes to be made, so we're, I'm not going to say that it's going to be published, but I, I would say that we would be happy to reassess it after a, a second round uh, of uh, work by the, by the author. Right? And then it will come back sometimes to the same reviewers, sometimes to other reviewers, or just to the editor, because the editor then already has the, you know, the, the responses from, from the reviewers, and, and he or she may decide if the authors were able to solve the problems that had been seen or not. But I guess the order in which I presented uh, those stakeholders, editor first, is because the editor may desk reject our paper. In, fa in fact, it happens very often that papers are desk rejected by the editor because the editor says, well, this paper doesn't fit my journal, for example. And again, I say, well, if you want to be published, make sure that you understand the journal, that, that you know the journal that you're sending the paper to. If your paper is about a topic that that journal is not interested in, you're going to waste time, your, your time and the editor's time. Uh, but the editor is the first gatekeeper. If the editor is, at least if, it, if he or she is not unhappy about the paper, or if, if, they, if, they, if this person thinks that the paper has some potential, it's going through a deeper level of analysis than by the peers uh, in a double-blind review process. And notice that a double-blind review, uh, we, we, we call double-blind blind review, some people think that it's because it's two people. It may be two, three, four people. The, the double-blind means that the author doesn't know who the reviewers are, and the reviewers do not know who the, the author is. Well, I don't know, uh, Gabriel, if I, if, I, if, if I got to the part that you wished. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Alex. Okay, thank you. See, uh, uh, now we already have here the, the parts of the, the paper, the introduction, very important, and what should, what should we have in the introduction? And of course, again, I'm saying that we should not go very further away from the template or from the, the structure that I'm proposing here, but in fact, each journal will have a slightly different structure that they prefer, right? So again, it's better know the journal you want to submit your, your, your paper and format your paper to a journal. Don't, don't write a paper and then start sending it. Send it to journal one, get rejected, send to journal two, get rejected. You're going to get be rejected by a lot of uh, journals simply because your paper doesn't fit their own uh, more usual format. But we definitely have to have an introduction where we contextualize our, our, our research, where we justify it. Sometimes we even provide our, our motivations for, the, for, for the, the research, and we clearly state the objective. Then we have uh, a literature review, which sometimes is called theoretical foundations. In fact, uh, in, in, in more, let's say, how they call, um, uh, positivistic uh, areas, uh, uh, we, we usually do a literature review if we were in areas, for example, in sociology, they love theoretical foundations because depending on your, the theory that you use to analyze a specific phenomenon, your results are going to be different. It's all, I, I, I usually say that it's almost like you decide on the glasses that you put in, put in front of your eyes and depending on your glasses, you see reality differently. Right? 
In a more posit positivistic world, where we think that reality is the same for everyone, literature review is more than enough because literature review shows where others have been before and tells us that we don't have to do exactly what others have done and we can take a step further, right? So this would be the second, uh, uh, usually the second uh, session. Methodology would be, usually be the third. But you'll see that our journals that prefer to have it in reverse. First have the methodology and then the literature review or, or, or the first have the methods, uh, how they call tools and methods or something, and then the literature review. You have to check, you know, what the, 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 the format, what, what the, the structure is for that specific uh, journal. And then results and conclusion, right? Uh, results could be discussion or you usually present your results and you discuss. I see that some of you uh, uh, talk about restrictions here. And sometimes you talk about limitations. Right? Limitations is something that appears many times in the conclusion. You, you, you express your main results. Uh, in fact, the conclusion is, uh, it's interesting. You, you, in the introduction, you say what you're going to do. Then in the body of your, your work, you do it. And then in the, in the, the discussion, you tell what you did, and then in the conclusion, you tell what you did in a summarized way. Right? Uh, uh, people that are not in academia sometimes think that we are repetitive. Uh, I, I don't think that we should be repetitive, but we should be very clear on what we're doing in each uh, session. And in the conclusion, we definitely do repeat because we summarize uh, the main aspects of discussion. But then we also have to provide the reader with the limitations of our study, right? because uh, any study, I mean, all studies will have some sort of limitation. And in fact, uh, one of the things that I had written here to, to, not to forget is that a research project, uh, a research is a project. And being a project, it is constrained by time, money, and quality. You have three, those, the, the three, the golden uh, triangle of uh, projects. Um, it's very, very good for research projects. You have to decide on, you even decide on your objective and your method, depending on the time that you have or the resources that you have. Uh, so you have to balance these things. Right? Um, and, and, and the same happens with writing the, the, the report. Right? After you've done your research, writing the report, writing the, the, the paper is also a smaller project, but it's still a project. Right? And, uh, and it's a project that again involves you assessing uh, what your audience is, you know, who you're writing for. Uh, what your what the gatekeepers will be looking for in your paper and making sure that you you do whatever is needed so that you can go through them the, the gatekeepers um, uh, it's a project in which you have to think of the structure of how you're going to, to write that paper uh, based on you know the, the based on, on, on the outlet that you are using the, the, the journal where you're going to send uh, it's a project that involves something that I haven't discussed so far but it's very important and it appeared in one of the 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 YouTube videos that uh, we assigned uh, to, be re uh, to be watched before our meeting today, that is uh, writing an outline. Remember that when I was in, uh, well, still in elementary school, I think in the fifth or sixth grades, I had a, a teacher who was very good. I, I think he was the, the, the guy who told me how to write. And I have to say, I, I, for me, it's good to write. I, I wrote my first non-academic book when I was 10, right? first published book when I was 10 years old. And it was because of this teacher. And he told us that whenever we were going to write anything, we, we, we definitely needed to have an outline. And the outline is basically a list of topics. Before you write the, 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 the paper, write this list of topics that have to be included. Organize them. Nowadays, it's much easier to do that because we do it in a, in a desktop, uh, in a, in a word processor, right, uh, on Word or something. So it's easy to cut and paste in different orders. But basically, before you start writing a lot on a, on a specific topic, have a list of the topics that will have that you have to write at least or maybe the paragraph that you have to write because uh, this will save you a lot of time it will it will give you a clearer idea of what you have to do it will it will help you not write uh, a text that is completely unbalanced afterwards uh, another issue unbalanced sometimes you see a paper that has uh, half of the paper is the introduction of course there is something wrong there how can't the, the the author notice that it's basically many, many times the author did notice that the the, the the introduction was very long, and then there was little room for, for the rest of the paper. But then he or she had already put so much effort into writing that beautiful introduction that they don't want to cut it out. So outline your project first, know what the, the important topics are, and then start writing a little bit uh, of each. I don't know exactly each one of us will find a different uh, parts of the, the, the paper from which to start. Uh, in the other video, uh, in fact, I think uh, the same video that the, the chemistry professor that you watched there, he claims 
that a good part to start is the discussion because everyone is enthusiastic about their data. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I feel that I, I can write a little bit in each part and, and having a word processor uh, makes this very easy. But the thing is, uh, never do start writing before you have outlined the whole project because this will help you uh, get into a paper that has I should have a question about that. You know, the percentage of the, the, the paper that should be the introduction, the percentage of the paper that should be the review, the percentage of the paper, I mean, in size, right? There should be methodology, discussion, and, uh, and conclusion. Uh, but maybe that's uh, homework for all of us. Uh, when we start reading other people's uh, papers, we already notice that there is, it's almost like if, uh, you know, someone has a very big head or very long, I, I'm that kind of person, I have very long arms, right? I'm very tall and very, have very long arms. So, I'm, I'm probably not this, the right structure, right? Uh, the best structure would be that one that will, uh, that the format uh, is, is not going to be noticed, right? And people then can focus on the content. But in order to do that, we cannot have a, a, an introduction that is half the paper, a methodology that is only half a page when the paper, when the paper is a 15 page long paper, uh, you know, uh, references that are five page long in a, in a eight page long paper, there's, there's things that you say, well, this is, it's almost like someone having a very big head or very long legs or a big belly or whatever, right? We have to try and, and find a way that the format becomes so discreet that people focus on the content. But knowing that nobody focus on the content before they are happy with the, 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 with the form. I, I, yeah, the, the, I had the, the slide on, on good practices, but uh, I think I've already mentioned some of the things that I, I wish to, to to say here, that is, you have to plan your research and you have to plan the reports uh, for that research. And so I don't think that we, we need to spend too much longer here. I would like to have as much time as we can now for uh, for questions and for reflections and for- I have a comment to make. Uh, so about the where to start, right? So I knew, at least for me, from experience, I have problems with, if I start with, in, with the abstract or the introduction, my quality of text won't be good. I mean, I have to do a lot of work. It's, I would say it's both like, the last part, Diego. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's like writing a story, but in order to write the beginning, you need you need to know the, the end or the most important exactly. part of it. So uh, at least, I, I mean, I saw the video and I and I never realized how how the, the starting point could be the results because it's it's the content, it's the most important of it. Of any of any paper, and uh, but I, I knew that starting from the beginning, really from the beginning, like the chrono in the, the formats, like the introduction or the abstract, is a bad idea. It's generally a bad idea. It's for... a very bad idea. Uh, Diego, uh, my my impression is that notice what do we have in the introduction? In the introduction, we contextualize our 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 problem, and we present the objective, right? In fact, the, the whole process is sort of recursive. Uh, we, we, it's, it's a process of going and coming back. So uh, it's very good that we have a word, a word processor. If it's very good that we have word latex or whatever to write uh, papers these days. I don't know how it was uh, in the times uh, in, for previous generations. In fact, I remember that my mother, when she was writing her, she, she's a, she has a master's in, in education. Uh, and uh, in the, I think in the 80s, when we still do not have, I mean, computers were starting to show up, but I remember that she uh, wrote her dissertation, her master's dissertation in a typewriter. And, and then me and, and my, my brothers had to help her cut and paste. At that stage, it was really, that's where cut and paste come from because we cut uh, pieces of, of paper and pasted in, in different pages because she was changing the order in which she was presenting her ideas. But I would say, you're right. Probably the, the introduction is probably the last part that you have to write because it, that's where we, as we say in Portuguese, and you can only sell something that you know exactly what it is already. So leave it for, for, for the end. And the abstract, it would be, I would say that should be written even after the introduction, because the abstract then is easy after uh, the, the whole paper is, is ready. It's basically what you have to have there is your objective, the methods, and your results. Okay. Other questions? By the way, uh, there is another way that we can, uh, you can ask here, but also if we want to use the Mentimeter here, there's also the possibility of writing down questions there if anyone uh, wishes to use that, uh, this technology here. Right? Oh, by the way, I have a, another comment to make. You said earlier that the essays are, are basically written based on someone's experience and it's very 
repair, correct? And the way of writing is more personal, isn't it? Because I, I, I stumbled on a paper that uh, he was like saying, I, 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 do, I did this, did that, and it's more personal in terms of writing. Yeah, right? this, actually, this thing of using the first person uh, is something that you also check the journal where you're writing to. No, you, you know, there will be journals that will be very happy uh, to, to have papers written in the first uh, person. I would say most positivistic journals do not accept that because they think that res uh, research is independent from the researcher. They think that whoever did that. Yeah, it's, it's actually the first time that I see this. And, and yeah. the August papers were like more, uh, more personal. But of course it depends because if, if you're writing, for example, depending on the methodology that you're using, for example, if you're using a very a qualitative methodology and uh, and your paper is very impredative, I, uh, uh, it's really you as a researcher acknowledge that you being the one who's developing that research have a huge impact on the results. If it was someone else, their experiences or, or, or that there would be other issues that would be involved. So uh, if you're writing that kind of research that uh, some, some, let, let's say, uh, someone like uh, there in physics would never consider to be scientific, but in business and, and in sociology uh, and uh, in anthropology and in several other areas, uh, ethnography, for example, is this kind of research, right? You, you go there, you experience a situation, and then you report your experience. Uh, I would say that many times, uh, and I, I agree with that, it's better to be vaguely right than precisely wrong. Uh, and what this interpretative uh, research uh, proposes is to be vaguely right. They don't want to have a, a, a statistic uh, uh, proof to, 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 their, uh, to, to their results, uh, but, but, they, 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 but they want to be vaguely right. And in that case, they can use the first person and there's no problem. But if you're going to write in first person a, a paper in which you are assuming that you are a fly on the wall, that you, you as a researcher does not affect at all the, the field that is being researched, I would say that avoid using first person. But you're right, an essay could be written in the first person because an essay is based on someone's experience. Right? And I hope you understood why I said that uh, an essay should never be our first uh, uh, paper. And in fact, uh, probably, I mean, it took me 28 years before being invited to write an essay. Uh, yeah, I and so I was over that I was invited to write an essay now. It's just that I couldn't find the time to write it. <laughs> so I, I was just yeah, curious I, because of the uh, how the language you use it to, to write the essay. So yeah. So for, for beginners, what is the most important thing to do to write a paper? I would say it's very important. Possibly the, the it's not for a beginner. I mean, we're all we're always all beginners in this matter, right? Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, you would be surprised with the amount of rejection that senior seasoned professors have. When they submit their papers of course we, we learn some of the tricks there are a few things that we know well the reviewer is going to say this or that depending on what i do so i will make sure that uh, i do not provide him with the possibility of doing that uh, so i think there are some tricks that you learn over time uh but i think everyone uh, has a tough time with uh making sure that your research is uh goes through the gatekeepers and reaches uh the the the, the the readers and that's not a bad thing because many times you know when the review when reviewers refute your paper if they give you uh, your good reasons for that you will learn from that you improve your research and you are going to have a stronger paper later on right? of course we don't like to be to have a paper rejected because it seems that it's going to be extra work but at the same time we shouldn't be concerned about the work that we did but actually the results that we got so we should always be very thankful to, to, to reviewers that um that um uh, give us uh, a good, interesting, uh, um, you know, uh, answers or, or or show us problems that we have and that we need to fix in our our work. Before I, I would see that it, it's popping a lot of our questions here already, and I'm, I'm seeing the first one there. So uh, it's it's not only for beginners for for anyone. I, I would say that probably the, the trickiest thing is to define a, a, an objective that is relevant, that is interesting, and of course you can only do that after reviewing the literature and everything. And but at the same time, that you can solve with the methodology that is available. So it's always very important to match method with objective. If you have a good ma uh, match, if you have a, an interesting objective that you can solve or a problem that you can solve with uh, a methodology that, that is available to you, you will probably have an interesting paper, right? Good question here, when, when to submit an article and, uh, uh, and it was rejected, can we make changes and submit to another paper? For sure. For sure, in fact, the idea is that you receive the feedback from the reviewers. Uh, if, if the reviewers were good reviewers, you will 
realize that the problem, the, the, the paper had problems, and then you assess it if there are problems that can be solved, and you solve the problems and send to another journal or even to the same journal, depending on the, the situation. Uh, or you decide that, okay, uh, I learned the bad, the, the hard way that uh, this is not the way I should have done it. Uh, there is no way I can fix this situation, but I, I should learn for, for future for future instances, for future situations. Situation. What else here? Do you believe that the formats imposed by conferences and places of publication can affect the quality uh, of the study? For example, reduce number of pages to present a manuscript. Maybe. Uh, in general, what happens here is that conferences ask for shorter papers because they expect that you're going to present your paper in the conference. And then uh, getting the feedback from the audience to that conference, you're going to be able to, to, to write what we call a final publication to be published in a journal. Right? So they don't want a very long paper in the conference because usually it's not expected that you write the same paper for the, the conference and then it goes exactly the same way to the, to the journal. Right? Uh, the idea is that the journal is publishing a paper that is uh, a little more elaborated. Uh, gee, uh, let, me, let me go a little faster here. Uh, hi, I would like to know your opinion about the presence of a section dedicated to literature review. We are still encouraged to write it, even though internationally they are becoming more rare. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's not my impression that uh, it's uh, it's becoming more rare. Maybe it's not called literature review. Maybe depending on the journal, it's called something different. Uh, the literature review uh, is important uh, if it's not done in a bureaucratic way. Uh, a bureaucratic literature review, I agree, that is not worth uh, anything. But a good literature review, it tells you, it even helps you uh, define more clearly what your project is going to be about because you know more clearly what is already, what, what has the problems that have already been solved and those that haven't, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if I completely agree with you. Maybe we can discuss this uh, a little further uh, later. Write me on, 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 well, not on chat, write me, if you can write me on Moodle uh, because then I can answer back to, 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 to everyone if that's the case. Is it a good idea to start writing a report before the research is finished? In case not, I, th I think so. I mean, uh, as I said, it's an iterative, uh, iterative uh, process. Uh, it has comes and goes. Uh, writing helps us clear up our minds. But remember, write the outlines first. If you have good outlines, you're probably not going to waste much time doing that. But if you don't have a good outline of what you are planning, you probably write things and then later you'll notice that that's not worth uh, much. During your career and experience, what were the three main reasons for rejection? Uh, I don't know if it's three, but uh, I'd say that uh, one reason for rejection is, uh, and the, the, probably the only reason for, for, for rejection is whoever read my paper did not understand my point. Uh, and then the reasons for that was either my point was not good or uh, the person who, 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 who read or reviewed was not up to the stand. Right? It happens also, right? There are, in fact, I already had situations in which I had a paper rejected in a very uh, important uh, conference. And uh, the year later, I submitted exactly the same paper to the same conference and it got a prize. So sometimes it's just a matter that it's different reviewers. But of course, again, you have to, I got the reviews the first time and I, I, I noticed that they did not help me improve the paper. And I said, and I had the, the feeling that the paper was a good paper. Uh, so I decided to, to resubmit it. Uh, uh, we, we, we don't know, I mean, that's not necessarily the, the case. There are cases, in, and I wouldn't recommend that you keep pushing a paper uh, to conferences just to see if they will accept it, right? In fact, uh, we live in, a, in a, world, a crazy world in which people are sort of assessed by the, the, the number of papers. That they used to be assessed by the number of papers that they published, but I think it's much, much more important than the number of papers is the quality of the papers that you publish. Right? You're not going to have a career based on thousands of papers written to bad journals, to bad uh, conferences, or just you know, sending them to all different places. Uh, of course, it's, it's not ethical to send to two papers at once. You have to wait for it to be rejected to send it somewhere else. But, but even so, if you just send it, if you get a rejection and you send the same paper uh, without doing anything about the, the, the reviews that you had, I think you're not doing the, the, the right thing. And you may regret because you may at one stage have, have a bad paper published and uh, that could be a reason for embarrassment later on, right? Because uh, after it's published, you cannot recall it and, and say, don't publish my paper, please, right? It's going to be there and other researchers will see it and they will see your name uh, connected to that and say, was this that guy that I thought I was a good researcher who wrote this? I don't trust him any longer. Uh, well, there's a problem here. Let me see if I, what, what I probably have to do here, let me see if I can uh, cancel this one on the top. 
of problems with the technology here. Okay, I closed the voting there just because I want to. Uh, okay, there is. Okay, just a sec. I think I can start doing this so that I. Okay, so this has already. We've already done this. Is a good idea. Is it a good idea to start writing a report before we've already done that, right? Uh, during your career. Okay, now this we've already done it. Uh, is there a, co a, a, a conduct code implicit for reviewers asking this because I got a rejection and looked like the reviewer gave me personal negative feedback? That happens. We're all human. Uh, there is going to be good reviewers and bad reviewers. There's going to be reviewers that are in a good day or in a good mood and reviewers that aren't. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it's a human process. Uh, uh, and as I said, uh, I, I can't blame, I can't say that the, the two reviewers that rejected a paper that the next year got a prize, that they were bad reviewers. Maybe they were in a bad, it was a bad day, right? Uh, so uh, that could happen. Uh, we, let's say reviewers are all volunteer, volunteers. So uh, I, I would say that it would be a bad practice if someone does bad reviews all the time, uh, and then it's better to stop doing it. Right? But I'm sure that Everyone has a day when we're not as clever or as able to give people good advice. Uh, and I'm sure that there will be days uh, in which we will also write reviews that are not that great. We have to understand that this is a human process, right? Uh, so trust yourself, but at the same time, think that whenever you have a review that points out a problem, think, well, that person noticed that as a problem. Is there anything that is worth doing to try and solve that? Because many times there is. Given the difficulty that people born in non-English speaking countries have to write in the language, do you think it would be a good initiative for any conference or entity to translate the best works to send international, to international conferences? Uh, they probably don't have the, the, they wouldn't have the resources to do that. I think that uh, the, the language barrier is becoming easier to overcome. Uh, as I think I said the other day, uh, Google Translator is becoming good. It's still not perfect, but at least it's good enough so that you, you can write in your in your own language and, and Google translate it and uh, and then maybe have a native speaker of that other language of English uh, read it uh, and, and just to polish it up. Uh, I think that's a good strategy for now. But I'm sure that in a few years, Google Translate or any other of these translation translating machines is going to be great. And we will write in our own language. Right? Uh, up to now, I, for example, I prefer to write, if I'm writing in a text that is going to be, pop, that I hope to be published in English, I prefer to write it directly in English. Uh, but it's because for me, it's not so difficult. But otherwise, uh, and I'm sure that after we have machine translations that are better than they are today, I will write in Portuguese, but I, because I still feel that I must my own language better than, than, uh, than English, right? Uh, and uh, if I can write a good structure in Portuguese, and have that good structure turned into a good structure in, in English, I'll be more than happy to, to do that. Uh, so I think things are, are getting better. Uh, but for now, we, we still have, this is still a barrier for us. Uh, I'm sure that whoever has English as their native language has a huge advantage these days. And this is why most of the, the most cited researchers in the world end up being researchers from the United States uh, or from, from, from England uh, even today. Uh, if, if I get a rejection, what is the best way to address the mentioned issues? Is there any guideline? Well, see, uh, it's not only when you get a rejection, even when you, you get a, a, an acceptance or at least a, a, a major review uh, where there's a lot that is being uh, pointed out to you, I would say I, my, my way of returning a, a, a paper to a journal is I write, I include a table in which I, I put the remarks of the reviewer in the left side and then what I did to solve them in the, in the, in the right side. If, if the paper was not rejected, I, I think you're mentioning here, if it was rejected, uh, I would say probably if, if it was rejected, you, you don't have a chance with that paper in that journal. You have to look for another outlet. Uh, but I would still say have, a, have a, a very good look at the reviews because there's always something said there that you should uh, try to use and improve the quality of your paper before you submit to, to the second uh, journal because otherwise you're going to be rejected there as well. Uh, what is your opinion uh, on preprint papers? Uh, they call on you as well, Flavio. So, uh, feel free to uh, preprint. Uh, yeah. Do you want to say anything? No, I think that uh, for the preprints, is it good? I think uh, is it good for for addressing the issue of paid uh, paid um, 
companies, private companies that share the papers, you know. We are, we are in a, in a moment, uh, we're living as a, a moment now that is, let, let's say we are in, in, a, in a very interesting time. I think that some of these big editors in the world will have to change the way they deal with uh, public, with academic publications. In yeah. fact, in, in my own case, for many years, I had this idea. I work on a public uh, university. I do research with public money. Uh, the results should be open to the people. Right? Uh, and so for many years, I did not uh, send any paper. So I, I, I and, and in fact, I, I, in my, let, let's say, in my time as a, a, a researcher, uh, it was good enough if most of our publication was done in Brazil. Right? Uh, so I, I didn't, I didn't feel that I, I needed to uh, publish uh, internationally. I did it very little in my life. Uh, and in business, that, that is very often the case. I know that in, in computer science, uh, people are more, uh, or have published uh, internationally more often uh, than in, in, in business, uh, but usually papers are shorter. That's not the case in information systems because information systems, as, as we're dealing with the details, as we're dealing with situations that involve people as well, usually papers tend to be long. So if you have a 15 page long paper or 20 page, uh, uh, 20 page long paper, uh, you will find uh, it, uh, it, it's very costly to, to, to write in, in a different language uh, and it, it costs even, I mean, if you have to have a review or something, that will cost money, right? So for my generation, we didn't have to do that much. I started doing that, that a little bit more recently, mainly because of my students, because it, it became important for them, right? And I think it's important for most of you, whoever is starting now, publication will have to be international. But again, as I'm saying, it's going to be much easier. You have classes now in English, the thing that we're doing now, right? That was something that was completely unthoughtful at the time that I was a student. Uh, so you have classes in English. I mean, we are we are we interact with a lot more material in English these days than in the past, uh, and we'll have good translators, machine translation uh, uh, tools that will help us also in the in the, in the future. Uh, but we still have a disadvantage there. Uh, and preprints, uh, the, the idea of preprints, I think it's mainly uh, uh, related to gaining time to to make sure that your that your paper is already accessible to people even before uh, uh, being uh, published. I, have, I haven't done it, so I, I don't have a, a, it's not that I have a, an opinion against it, it's just that I, I haven't done it. And finally, how to research if a magazine is, uh, a magazine, I suppose a journal, is relevant to the publication of a paper? Well, my, my way of doing that is, considering the number of, of, of journals that we have these days, I never, obviously I would never publish in one of these papers, one of these journals that is advertising online uh, and trying to, try to get uh, people to send them uh, papers. Uh, uh, but, but at the same time, I, I, I'm happy to even to, to publish or to send a paper to be uh, evaluated in a journal that uh, is, doesn't have a very large impact factor, but is a paper where other papers similar to mine have been published. I think that that is probably, that will give me a better chance of having my own paper cited because that journal is a place where people send papers with that, those characteristics. And then my trick there is, Whenever we're writing, we check our references. When we have that, we're we're citing two or three papers from a specific journal. That journal is already uh, a, a journal that we will take into account. For example, we just we, last year we published a, a paper in a, in a journal that I had never read intentionally. I had only read because you know nowadays you you you, you look for papers in databases. So I I, I, I had uh, read papers in, in that journal because they they were brought to me by the the, the database. Uh, it was a jail journal. Uh, and then after we, I mean, we were citing three or four papers that had been published in that journal. I told uh, my my student that maybe we, we should try and send it to that journal. And I was very happy. The paper uh, has gotten a few citations already. And it was a journal that, jail journal, uh, a journal that was not in my radar because it's a journal that is, it's important for the people in geography and, and they do some things related to geography and, 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 and of course, uh, informatics or, or computer science. And our, our paper was uh, about uh, uh, basically mapping this, the, the streets of a city for, for people with uh, disabilities, for, for visually impaired people. Uh, so it was sort of the, 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 the ways of uh, the blind people. Uh, that, that was our intent. Uh, and, and we're happy with that. So, I think I, I, the only thing that I don't do is I never look at qualis. I, I have already helped build qualis in the past, and I know of all its flaws. It's uh, I mean it, it was an important system. I think it, it still is important for promotion in, in many cases, but uh, but I don't think that qualis 
is the way I should choose the journals where I have where I want to publish. Okay. With that, I think I finished this one. Uh, um, yeah. So guys, next week we're gonna have uh, uh, we're gonna have uh, a seminar with uh, Leonardo Basilar from the National Center of uh, Disaster Monitoring and the Early Warning. So he's gonna talk about mobility analysis during the coronavirus, the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, and uh, we shared. Uh, we shared the paper on Moodle for those uh, for you get prepared. You just read a little bit and uh, just write some nice questions. That just write some nice questions to ask uh, to Leonardo, which is going to be very nice. And uh, that's the actually I start from the last. So the first one's about registration. So for those who are doing isolated event and also for the students, it's really good if you just register your attendance for the seminar. It's really good for us to you know track the attendance, get to know who is coming and uh, actually uh, certificates. Exactly, and also for the certificates. And uh, Alishan is going to provide this, and it's really good to do it. And uh, yeah. another thing that's really good for us to understand who is not from the UTFPR and also from uh, UFAC and get to know these people. Maybe we can just, just do some straight uh, invitation for different stuff. And uh, yeah, this registration is going to be really good for that. And uh, yeah, so if you are a student for this uh, for these courses at UF, UTFPR and also UFABC, you should just go to Moodle and uh, start to write your thoughts about this today's seminars. And uh, it's really good uh, that we have this feature on Moodle so you can interact a little bit more and uh, discuss a little bit about the concept that Alexander shared with us today and uh, also, you know, uh, improve and uh, also uh, Engage a little bit more with your peers. It's, it's really good. It's really good to you know get the feedbacks from other people and uh, improve actually this collective. What is the name actually? It, in collective intelligence that you mentioned. Collective on intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> it's really good. So you know, if, if anyone ever misses uh, uh, our our or if, if we have any problem in the future, we can have a session on collective intelligence because I think it's it's an interesting topic for us to discuss here. Exactly. So for the for, so the the forum is going to work like that, you know. So we have this collective intelligence in which the students and also professors, uh, invited professors, can share their thoughts and uh, you know get to know about the topic or a specific topic. And this is going to be really good for everybody, you know. And so I think that I answer Murilo's question, right? So we have to. It's really good if you just register your attendance every week, so we can uh, track your attendance, not only your attendance, but understand what is the behavior of people. Are, what are the other people that are coming from the for the seminar? We are improving a little bit more the the invitations. We're expanding a little bit more in the invitations. I think the first uh, the first seminar it was just like a closed one, so we invited just a few people, and now we just shared on Facebook. I should share on Facebook, and I'm sharing on the uh, institutional page as well. So we are sharing on WhatsApp groups, so and we are expanding a little bit more the audience. So it's really good that we have uh, the people get the email, and then we can invite these people to come for the next seminar as well. Uh, so that's why we are asking you to register your tennis every week. Uh, yeah, so I, I, at the UFABC, where I, I'm not tracking, I'm not tracking attendance. So I'm not considering 75% of attendance for the discipline. Uh, the way I'm doing that uh, is through the, the summaries. So for people that are actually submitting the post and the pre-summary, I'm, I'm using this, uh, this activity to track and also to uh, do the grade. I'm not sure, Shandy, you want to uh, mention? I'm also, you know, of course, we want to have attendance uh, for mainly from the students that, that this, this, they're getting a certificate, right? Uh, that they're getting a certificate. What I mean is that they're getting credits for this, uh, but we're not crazy about the specific number. So if it's 75%, it's important that you are involved, that you're engaged, that you do the, the tasks that you have to do before and after uh, each of our uh, meetings here, right? Exactly, yeah, that's the point. All right, if there is anyone by any chance that still, uh, I'm not sure, uh, registration at UTFPR was last week, but if anyone still wants to take this for credits, just send me an email and I can uh, check with the coordinator of the Computação Aplicada there and see if it's still possible, right? Okay, guys. See you next week. See you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.